Thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here with a very distinguished panel. Um, I would also note that my cameras are here for my show, so uh, I'm sure that on the subject of the international economy, there will not be huge outbursts of uh, uh, spontaneous applause or booing, but were you to have such an inclination, I would appreciate it if you would not do it because the cameras will catch it uh, and, uh, and it, it will not work so well for, for the television show. So don't stand up and cheer or, uh, or boo, uh, and please turn your cell phones off. Um, those are the only constraints within which we're operating. We will uh, take uh, your questions after we got, get through an um, initial period of uh, a conversation amongst ourselves. Um, what I want to do is uh, begin by just quickly, um, not really introducing, um, but reminding people of who are, are on the panel here. Kristalina Georgieva, who is of course the managing director of the IMF. Um, Ray Dalio, who uh, founded what is the world's largest hedge fund and has written a really extraordinary book that charts four or 500 years of economic history uh, and draws conclusions, and establishes patterns and draws conclusions from it. Uh, Andrei Plankovic, the Prime Minister of Croatia, and uh, Valdis Drombovsky, the European Vice President for an Economy that Works for People. This is a new title, or at least as best I know, but better known as the EU Commissioner for Trade, uh, which is a very powerful uh, position because uh, people often talk about how Europeans are not united. Well, on one issue, they are very united, which is trade, and they operate like a superpower in that, in that uh, arena. And so the world is really on trade issues, a tripolar world, the United States, the European Union, uh, and China. Um, what I thought we'd do is get a sense from this extraordinary and distinguished panel first, just where are we in terms of the challenges before the global economy right now. I, I can think of really no one better to do it um, than Kristalina, who has run a country, come out of, uh, you know, has had the experience of coming out of a communist economy, uh, the, 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 emerge, the emerging uh, reality of capitalism and democracy, now has been running the, man, uh, the IMF with extraordinary skill and integrity, I may say. Um, so, Kristalina, tell us, what do you think is going on? We are uh, faced with uh, a crisis upon a crisis in a fairly sh short period of time. Two shocks that are exogenous <coughs> to the countries that are experiencing. So even countries with strong fundamentals can be brought on their knee to their knees as a result. What we face today is the realization that our interdependence is so high, demonstrably a virus in Wuhan forced us to press the pause button of the global economy for two years, and the unthinkable, a war in Ukraine, is causing hunger in Africa. We have downgraded our projections for growth in a short period of time twice. In January, why? Because Omicron caused tremendous disruptions of, of supply. And then in April, because of the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the sanctions that were imposed as a result. And since we downgraded the forecast from originally 4.9 to now 3.6%, three things happened. Tightening of financial conditions, appreciations of the dollar, and further slowdown of China 
as a result of lockdowns. So further downgrades are not out of question. But I want to immediately say what worries us more is not the fact that we have these downgrades, because from 3.6% to get into negative territory for the world economy, there is a long way uh, to go. What worries us more is the risk that we are going to walk into a world of more fragmentation with trade blocks and currency blocks separating what was up to now still a integrated world economy. And here is the paradox. What did the two crises teach us? They taught us that we actually need each other and uh, we saw it with the vaccines. The, the only reason we are here is because we have a global vaccination program. They taught us that we have to find a pathway to work together, and yet the trend of fragmentation is strong. I lived on the other side of the Iron Curtain. I hated it, and I can tell you it scares me that maybe we're sleepwalking after the hot war into another cold war. What is reality today for it? Reality is that we also learn from these two shocks that we need to pay more attention to security of supplies because more shocks will come in the future. And therefore, the old concept of economic efficiency only based on costs is no more valid. We do have to integrate security of supplies in that concept. But this need not take us to making our future one of more division and inability to sort out problems for which we need to be together. Take climate change as just one example. And in our view, for it, what it would take is to actually be relentless in identifying what are the areas where we must and we can and we should continue to work together. So, Ray, you tell us what you think, how this fits in to the historical patterns that you've been studying so carefully. Okay. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, I'm a global macro investor, so all the liquid markets in the world, and I've been doing that for about 50 years, and I am just a, that makes me um, not ideological as much as just sort of practical, how does the machine work? Um, and I learned, in, and that's politics as well as uh, economics, because they're two tied together. And I learned uh, that many of the things that surprised me were, uh, were things that didn't happen in my lifetime, but happened before my lifetime. <laughs> and that everything that is coming to me is new, that hasn't happened into my lifetime, I have to study. And, and that's by studying the Great Depression, we were able to anticipate the 2008 financial crisis. So there's a mechanistic reason. There are cause-effect relationships. And three big things that are happening in our lifetime that haven't happened before, I needed to examine. And those three things, I think if we focus on them, they pretty much encompass most. Uh, those three things are, first, an enormous amount of uh, debt creation, which is debt that's monetized, that has to do with the value of money um, in, throughout history. It's been very much the case, in all cases throughout history, that when there's not enough money, there is the, then the creation of money. Rome, they had gold coins and they put other metals in it and they depreciated it and so on. So, so we have something that is going on with money, credit, and inflation. That's due to the fact that we don't have enough real money. Okay, that's, that's one fact. The second is internal conflict. 
Um, my measures, I like to have measures, and so there are lots of measures in this book. Um, we have populism of the left and populism of the right that are irreconcilable differences. History shows that when the causes that people are behind are more important to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. And so if you look at populism or you look at the size of the wealth gaps or the values gaps, they're the largest since the 1930 to 45 period and it's understandable. And the third is the great power con conflict. Um, we began our world order in 1945 and the pattern repeats all the time. There's a war, the winners of the war determine the world order, the rules of the game. That's why the United Nations is in New York and the IMF in, and the World Bank are in Washington. And then you have the world order and the dominant power. The United States had 80% of the world's money, money was gold, and it had half the world's economy and it had a monopoly on military power. And as that power changes, um, then you have great power conflict. And so you're having these three things happen again for the, basically the same mechanistic reasons. And if you go back through history, you see that they repeat over it. So they have this cause effect. So I think that when we look at the future um, and we calculate it for, for just year by year, we're now in 2022. We're in the part of, they always do it the same way, you have a downturn and they print money and credit because that's the way that you stimulate the economy and so on. It produces inflation. They tighten monetary policy, there's a trade-off. Um, and, um, and there we are. Now, then you take that forward and you look at 2022, there's a political thing going on. We're gonna have midterm elections in the United States. We're going to have a, a change in government um, the 20th People's Congress in China, and so on. There's a political thing going on. And then you take 1920, 2023 and 2024, and with this populism, you're going to have possibly irreconcilable differences. Um, in other words, it's entirely possible that neither side accepts losing in the domestic. And so when you have that going on, you need the historical context. So mechanistically, that very much looks the same. Um, th th that's fascinating, Ray. And both you and Kristalina talked about this issue of governments being forced to act. And the, the principal way in which they've done it, um, particularly for the COVID crisis, but increasingly uh, they're going to have to do it with the supply shocks and energy <coughs> problems, is through providing subsidies of various kinds. Um, Prime Minister, you're, Croatia is seen as a great free market uh, country. You are seen that way. How do you feel about all this free money being given uh, to, to people and this debt accumulation? Thank you, uh, Farid. Uh, coming from the youngest EU member state, a country which is just about to attain the final criteria in order to join the Eurozone as of 1st of January 2023, and I thank Valdis who has been helping us to navigate to a series of criteria in that respect and also country just about to join Schengen. Um, I have to admit that this situation that we are all facing in the last two and a half years has entirely altered the global agenda. This was supposed to be the decade of digital revolution or evolution and the decade of green transition towards the global climate change goals. What did we do since last uh, Davos? We were in pandemic, crisis management for two years. As soon as it was trying to eclipse a little bit from our attention, we have the Russian aggression on Ukraine, violating everything that we know about international law and international uh, system as we know it, attacking brutally a member state of the United Nations, causing threefold crisis. One, greatest tragedy for the Ukrainian people and the incredible humanitarian refugee crisis. Second, uh, leading to a spike of energy prices. That in turn leads us into a situation where we are all due to the fact that the raw materials prices have risen, due to the fact that the construction materials have risen, 
prices due to the fact that food prices are rising, we are all facing inflatory pressures. Why am I saying this as an introduction? I come from a center-right party, EPP. We are supposed to be a free market economy, social market economy, liberty of entrepreneurship, uh, responsibility of an individual. This is the triangle of our political philosophy. And then I look at my own track record. What did I do in the last two and a half years? I never stopped intervening. <laughs> my, my critical task was to avoid the social fracture. And we were facing the most incredible social fracture. We as a government insured salaries, bear in mind we are a country of all, a little bit less than 4 million people, we paid salaries to 700,000 people in private sector. And we sustained it. It never happened before. It, it was unimaginable before. We pardoned all possible uh, levies and taxes to our businesses in order to help them bridge the crisis. Now what we are doing when the energy crisis has hit us, again, a package which was up to 1% of our GDP two months ago in order to ensure that people who are vulnerable have social transfers to subsidize their bills for electricity and gas to people who are elderly. We made a one-off uh, huge investment for pensioners, putting down the VAT and other taxes, helping farmers, helping, helping agricultural sector, helping households and micro, small and medium-sized businesses because otherwise, for them, it would be untenable. And in that perspective, I think that we have all found ourselves, this was not only thanks to the Croatian funds but, or budget, it was also in the synergy of the European efforts. And I think that what, what my morale, what my message was, that we had a big problem with COVID and we had a big answer at the European level jointly. I think the EU Next Generation is a unique uh, joint effort to help the citizens and the member states. Now, with the Repower EU, we are doing almost a like exercise of a smaller magnitude, but still uh, with the objective that the state or the union at the European level serves its purpose. Now, the citizens can feel why the state exists in crisis and why the European Union is good and profitable, actually, for our citizens when they need it the most. Commissioner Dombrovskis, um, how should we think about the economic crisis that the Ukraine war has created? Um, uh, Kristalina talked about the dual crisis, and the most recent one, of course, is this economic crisis. That it is the, the crisis of the war itself, but then the economic crisis created throughout the world by this war. What is the best strategy to deal with that economic crisis? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, we uh, need to deal with root causes of the uh, problem, and root cause of the problem is uh, Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine. That's why EU was so determined to provide all necessary uh, support uh, for Ukraine to uh, defend itself, to uh, win this war, uh, that's why we are putting lots of uh, pressure uh, on uh, Russia. Already five sanctions packages are agreed and six uh, sanctions packages being uh, negotiated uh, because the faster we uh, stop the war, among other things, the faster we stop the economic implications of the war because there is a risk of this war getting uh, both protracted if uh, Russia manages, so to say, entrench itself in currently occupied territories, uh, or there is a risk also of this war uh, to spread because uh, uh, Russian politicians, Russian propaganda are making no secret of willingness to invade also other neighboring countries. So from uh, both point of view, uh, it's important to contain uh, Russia, and that's important from security point of view, but that's important also from economic point of view. Second, what was already uh, said, uh, one of the uh, channels how economic crisis is affecting uh, the uh, EU and indeed other countries uh, is high energy uh, prices. Uh, and uh, there, uh, in case of uh, EU, well, we have a dependency on Russian fossil fuels and we need to get rid of this uh, dependency. 
well, we already have pro uh, prohibited uh, uh, imports of Russian coal as part of the sanctions. Uh, we are currently discussing uh, oil embargo, but I would say sanctions or not, we anyway need to move fast away from uh, Russian uh, fossil fuels, and for this, European Commission has presented a plan, a Repower EU plan, which outlines how to deal with this. Uh, if we uh, go beyond specifically Russian fossil fuels, we see that uh, uh, in any case, uh, fossil fuel prices are high globally, so uh, 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 there it makes sense for us to move faster on the goals of the European Green Deal, phasing out fossil fuels altogether, moving to uh, renewables, investing more in uh, energy uh, efficiency, uh, in uh, other measures which uh, actually uh, reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and volatility of prices of uh, fossil fuels. So part of our strategy, Repower EU strategy, is to accelerate this uh, uh, rollout of renewables and accelerate the rollout of European uh, Green Deal. In between, obviously, we need to mitigate the negative uh, 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 consequences, and then uh, Prime Minister Plenkovich, other colleagues already uh, spoke uh, how it's done. Well, from the EU side, that's why we provide uh, EU member states with flex flexibility, both concerning EU fiscal and state aid rules, so that uh, EU member states have this room of uh, maneuver to respond uh, uh, to, to the crisis and to support uh, vulnerable uh, uh, households, to support uh, companies. Uh, there, however, I wanted to sound a note of uh, caution. Uh, already now we see that uh, 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 budget deficits and debt levels are elevated in EU member states. Uh, uh, debt uh, interest rates are gradually uh, growing, so this uh, uh, era of uh, very easy uh, uh, money uh, seems to be coming uh, to the end. So also there we'll need to strike the right balance. So, <clears throat> when you look at the scale of the problem, um, Kristalina, um, you know, you just signed a $44 billion package for Argentina, for little Argentina. And you think about the global food crisis that is being precipitated by this, uh, the war and really by, as you say, Russia's aggression and Russia's blockading of the, of the Black Sea and of Odessa. You're going to have crises in Pakistan, in Egypt, and you know, in all these places, you're going to have hunger and poverty and migration. Uh, then there's the cost of rebuilding Ukraine, which is being destroyed on a scale that we have not seen since the Second World War. Whole cities are literally being destroyed. I mean, you're going to need hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And it's, I guess, a question that people often ask the IMF, but it really feels just do you really have that kind of money? <laughs> well, to put everybody here as, at ease, uh, we have deployed about 300 billion out of our, our one trillion dollars war chest. We still have 700 billion there. But we did uh, something uh, very uh, important last year, and that was to issue a new allocation of special drawing rights. $650 billion. For Ukraine, for example, that meant a $2.7 billion injection that does not add to that because special drawing rights are this magic thing when we use the strength of all our 190 members to put forward reserves that is at no cost to anyone. But we did one more thing, and it matters in this crisis. We turned to our members, some are here, that are with strong position, and we said, you're getting these reserves, but do you really need it? Why don't you lend through us to those who really need it, at least a part of those? And we got, so far, over $60 billion, of which 40 billion we put in a very special thing to help address climate change called Resilient and Sustainability Trust. And I'm using this audience to say, hey, 
talk to your, if you are from a rich country, not necessarily only advanced economy, maybe emerging market economy in strong position, ask your parliament and government to do more, to reinforce the fighting power of an institution like the IMF, and we will need it. We are faced with a very heterogeneous world. One of the huge implications of this dual crisis is a growing and very dangerous divergence between those who have the capacity to deal with problems and those who don't. Uh, Farid, for three decades, we have been converging poorer countries catching up with the better offs. This is now gone. We are diverging. And when you look at the economic situation of countries, it is so different in terms of their growth prospects, inflation, burden, debt burden, where they're headed. What changes prospects? One, how strong you are to begin with, like, you know, with the COVID. If you have a strong immune system, you do fine. If you are weak, you're vulnerable. Two, how close you are to the epicenter of the Ukrainian war. The closer you are, if you are Moldova, if you are a country right there, you're at high risk. Three, how much an impact this increase in, in fuel prices and especially in food prices has on you. Europe there is more vulnerable because it is uh, more dependent. But think if, if you are in Africa or in, in, if you are Egypt or Lebanon uh, or any of the sub-Saharan uh, African countries. Your poor people spent before these shocks 40% on food. Prices of food double and triple. That virtually means people go to bed hungry and a famine is not out of question. So not only we need to step up, but we need grants to tackle some of the vulnerabilities of the poorest countries. And this is where the SDRs are so good because they are not adding to, to, to that. Is it possible for the world to stand up to these challenges? Yeah, we produce more food than we collectively can consume. Are we doing it? And the sad answer is no. But we must. Yeah, I think the food uh, crisis is one that really would, there is a way to achieve a certain kind of collective action, create a humanitarian corridor, move ships out of, out yes. of uh, Odessa, yes. um, and feed the world. I mean, that would be the, the argument. Um, Kristalina is right, Ray, that, uh, that the IMF has this magic capacity. Most countries do not. And what we are seeing is very high debt burdens. I'm sure you remember in your days uh, as an investor, the moment when Japan hit a uh, debt to GDP ratio of 75%, which was then the highest of any country in the advanced industrial world. And everyone said, oh my God, this is, you know, this is crazy numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, this seems to be the low end of the, uh, of the norm. What is going to happen to all this debt? I, th I think it's so really simple and also um, if we look at history, so there's a mechanical, um, there's money. Money has, is now fiat money. So you can produce money and credit. So naturally, everyone is in a position that they needed more money. Where did they get the money from? If there was limited money, they'd have to get it from someplace else. But what they do is produce money. So central banks produce money. Where does the money come from? You could have it from taxes and take it from somewhere else. 
But that's difficult because people want to hold on to it, and they don't want to give it up. But nobody asks, where do we get the, do we have enough money? So, but we need more money. Everybody agrees we need more money to spend. But if there was a limited amount of money, we would say, where do we get it from? And we'd have constraints. But we're not like that. So what happens is, naturally, you're in the positions that you need more money, and so the central banks uh, print more money. And then through all of this credit, everybody says, we need more money, we got more money. But then we devalue money, it becomes less valuable, and surprise, we get inflation. OK, shouldn't be a surprise. Um, so when we are looking at the circumstances, we're now in a new era. You know, we wish that there's coordination. We're, we've lived in an era um, where we were global. And the way resources were allocated was, where was it more cost efficient? So if it was cost efficient here, you'd send the capital, you'd build it there, and that would raise employment and so on. And that's what we've come to believe is a, is a fair system. But that's only because we've gotten used to that. But if you go back and look at history, um, and today, um, many people would believe that's not, not a fair system. So here we are in the fragmented world that we're in. And so the resource allocation system um, is no longer economic. The resource allocation is political and ideological. So when we ask ourselves and we wish for cooperation, it's understandable that we won't get cooperation because there is a risk, there is conflicts. There's an internal conflict of civil war. So how do we redistribute the wealth within our country? So we'll have it within the country. Well, there's a hell of a fight over that, right? And so there's the willingness to fight over that. And then the same is true internationally. So what is, you know, America first? Or, or what is that in terms of that? And so I think we have to understand, we have to keep in mind that when we say we're going to cooperate or should, in a world where self-sufficiency, because we could go to war, becomes important. The efficiencies are no longer the most important things. Survival is the most important thing. The possibility of a war is an important thing. And it changes behaviors in ways that are logical, but maybe undesirable for those of us who are in a perspective that we believe that we should be in this together. And how do we work together? So I think it's all understandable. Okay, so that depreciates the value of money. We are going to have more conflict we're going to have more inflation. Inflation um, causes domestic political conflict. So it'll be a big issue in the 2022 elections and the 2024 elections. That's just how the machine works. And in the meantime, we have, and the war in, in, the, in the Ukraine and Russia and with China is, a, um, is understandable in terms of a big, you know, the big powers conflicts. And so we see the world, if you read history and you see this happen over and over again, you see the world is now breaking up into sides. It's like their allied powers and their access powers and their neutral powers. And those ideologies become the dominant consideration. So it's entirely possible, for example, that we could see in, in, in China and so on that it's no longer desirable or politically acceptable to do business in China, and um, in, 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 it, it, may, it may not be. Now you think about how intertwined the world economy is. 22% uh, of American manufactured goods imports come from China. So not just imagine the implications for inflation and the inefficiencies. That's just mechanistically what's going on. So as a mechanic who was looking at next year and the year after and where we are in that thing, I'm just saying it's, it, it's undesirable. And the unimaginable is becoming increasingly probable. All right, we're gonna open it up to, uh, to questions. Um, Ma'am in the front there, um, if you can tell us who you are and um, you know, just if, if I may say that the, the question can be a question and not a statement, that would be wonderful. 
Hi, Alex Wallace. I run uh, content at Yahoo. I have a question for Ray. Looking at historical precedent, what do you think the likelihood of a civil war in the United States is? I, th I think that, I'll, I'll, I'll first define a civil war. Um, I think that it's reasonably probable that no side will accept losing in, now, what is that probability? I don't know, you could, maybe it's 50%, maybe it's even more than that. Um, I don't know. Um, that, I think it's probable, or there's uncomfortably high probability, that directions from the central government, rule of law and the Constitution, won't be, won't, may not be followed. Supreme Court rulings may not be followed because individual states say that I'm not going to do that. It's like sanctuary cities. They say I will not follow. I think what's happening now is that there is a movement uh, from one state to another with, due to changing values and, and changing, that's producing a hollowing out in some states. And when that happens, because the rich move someplace or the ideologies are the same, it produces a hollowing out in other locations. You're seeing that in New York and Chicago, San Francisco and other places. That exacerbates the gap. It exacerbates not only the wealth gap, but it uh, exacerbates the ideological gap. And then when you get to that rule of law and respect and compromise don't exist, then you deal with power and it becomes a power decision. And I think we're seeing this more and more, like uh, Disney's um, issue with the uh, state of Florida. You know, in, a, in the world mostly that I grew up in, it would be that they would respect their different views and you respect it. It becomes a power thing. State of, Connect, uh, state of Texas might not have Citibank uh, fl uh, issue the bonds and so on. And it becomes more and more that kind of conflict. So it becomes a power thing. I think that's developing in that kind of a movement in that direction. That's a very scary thing, because when you don't have rule of law or you start to have fighting, uh, it's a different world. I think you, you, there are signs of that, and, and history has shown, history has shown through times that when there are these uh, populism of the left and populism of the right, a populist is an individual who will fight for you. And so for each of the sides. And when they say, I'm going to fight for you, uh, they want fight to win. And there's no compromise. And so when you have that, there's, his history shows us that there's a loss of the middle. You can't be in the middle. You have to pick a side and fight on that side. So you could see in the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution and the Cuban and the Chinese and so many others, uh, they lose the middle because you have to pick a side. And the way it's resolved is that there's a conflict, a war, and who has the power? So I think that these things are emerging. Yeah. Yep. All right, um, can we get somebody else have a, a question? Um, I think if... Let me ask uh, the commissioner. Um, do you think that the Europeans can enact another round of sanctions that will really be tough enough given the gaping loop loophole of oil and natural gas? Uh, Putin is getting $350 billion of oil and natural gas revenues. Um, what can you do if you're going to keep that exception? Surely everything else becomes a little bit of window dressing. Uh, well, uh, uh, that's exactly uh, the problem. Uh, uh, if you look at the uh, trade structure between EU and Russia, so pre-war, 62% uh, of uh, Russia's imports were hydrocarbons. So we already have prohibited import of Russian coal. Part of the, and I would say central part of the six sanctions package is oil embargo. Member states are currently uh, discussing. Hopefully, it's uh, uh, possible to arrive uh, at, uh, uh, at the conclusion on this, uh, because uh, indeed, uh, otherwise, uh, there is this uh, problem that uh, with uh, one hand, we are providing massive support to Ukraine. With other hand, we are paying uh, Putin for its uh, uh, war. 
So uh, 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 clearly uh, we need to address it. But as I said already uh, before, sanctions are not strate strategic uh, decision to move away from Russian hydrocarbons is already taken and we are already working on this. And we also outlined plans, for example, how already this year we can reduce our dependence from Russian natural gas by two thirds by uh, diversifying the supplies and uh, faster rolling out some other measures. Prime Minister, you have any thoughts on this? <clears throat> I think that the idea to gradually phase out from the uh, Russian-based fossil fuels is a far-reaching political uh, move. I think that uh, we have all witnessed that the Russia's aggression on Ukraine has made the European Union, NATO, more unified, more solid, more coherent, even appealing to, for countries to join faster. You see interest of some for the EU and interest from some, some others on the NATO side because of the collective security of the Article 5. Uh, my firm belief is that the actual topic of this decade is energy. 99.5% of everything that any of us, of humanity, does around the world comes from some sort of energy source. And what we are witnessing now, in the context of all the crises, everything we have mentioned, that we need to substitute the supply chain of different energy sources which have held their usual uh, pipelines for decades. And uh, what we have done as a, as a country who is happy to have the Adriatic Sea, we were a little bit far-sighted last year and we opened an LNG terminal at the island of Kirk, which has in terms of uh, supply of gas altered our uh, entire margin, margin of maneuver in this context, not only for ourselves but also for Central Europe. I have the impression that the specific situation of some countries, and some are fully dependent on Russian gas, and some of them uh, very much on oil, um, is an element that requires time for the alternative supply chains to be fully in function, the whole grid, and fully functional. But we should not uh, take out from the equation the element of price. This is the key of this game now. And um, we are, of course, supportive as a country, and this is, this is our line all along. And I have to conclude that we are facing a very polarized world, not only authoritarian regimes against democracies, but also huge polarization within democratic societies. And this has been exacerbated by Internet, who was originally conceived to bring to global citizens the best of humanity, knowledge for free. In an unregulated world, it sometimes, from an individual, takes out the worst. And this is the issue we will have to address with education, with a very uh, intelligent and dedicated way to avoid the negative sides of global connectedness where anybody can say anything on anyone including the organized harassment, including the misinformation, thus creating a new generation of, of, of young people who are, I would say, lacking filters and are prone to manipulation. This I see as a general threat to, to our societies in, in an altered world that we have entered now. I want to ask you, um, Kristalina, to close on that, on that theme, which is you're somebody who came out of the Iron Curtain out of our, uh, you, you saw this new birth of freedom for your country, for yourself. Um, do you worry that we are moving backwards, that we are moving towards illiberalism, protectionism, fragmentation? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, what we face are very, very starking different pathways ahead of us. One in which we manage to stick together as a world, and then we have a chance for the better standards to be seen by all and desired by all, as we did on the other side of the Iron Curtain, or a world in which we close ranks within our uh, 
little bubble. And as a result, two things happen. We are poorer. Just technological decoupling would cost us 5% of GDP at least. And we bring down the standard of liberty and freedom for hundreds of millions of people. We should be very careful which pathway we choose. Also because we have a looming climate crisis that we cannot possibly resolve one block at a time. So my plea is for us to think of these choices as companies, as countries, as organizations very carefully because the unintended consequences can be quite grim. You tell us we are, we are done. We are on a pathway of separation. I'm an optimist. No, I don't no, no, believe. I'm... Yep, okay. It's, can yeah, we? Take I don't second. mean to interrupt. Take a second. No, please do. No, I think uh, it's all on how we are with each other. Um, we have the highest amount of GDP. We have the greatest longevity. Um, we have technologies, the ability to be productive, and so on. Um, no, I agree with you. I think you're at a Thanks. juncture, and the juncture is how we are with each other. It's that yes. totally comes yep. down to how we are with each other. So we have a choice. Yep. Right. I think you're in a sense saying the same thing. There are structural pressures, and you're saying, but there is still room for human action. Well, yes. uh, no, I, what I'm trying to say, they're not short-term pressures. They're big. Long, you need a yes. restructuring. Right. You need a, in a sense, a total restructuring and a dealing with that uh, of the debt and the social and so on. Mm -hmm. So the capacity exists within us to work well yep. together. It does exist. The probability of us, the probability of us working well together mm -hmm. um, for the common good and working that out is low. Yep. That's all I'm saying. But we have the power sure. to do it. I'm and and we, let need you, you. we need you, uh, Farid. We need the media to amplify the voices of reason. Um, and also the fact that majority of people are good, maybe not perfect, but good. There is this minority that are hateful and evil, but it is their voices that dominate today. So please amplify this voice of reason and goodness and care for our future. Thank you all. This is a great honor. Thank you.